particular order. Um, I'll start with uh, Ms. Colleen Chen. Uh, Colleen is a uh, here as a consultant for the Department uh, of, of Commerce, uh, and, and previously she, she's very well known for her research and writing on both domestic and international patent law and policy issues. I uh, have testified before both houses of Congress, of Congress uh, a number of times. Uh, additionally, we're joined by uh, Allison Schmidt. Uh, Allison is a fellow and director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology Life Sciences Project. Uh, and prior to joining BCLT, she clerked for the Honorable Stanley Chester in the District of New Jersey uh, and Kathleen O'Malley at the Federal Circuit. We're very happy to be joined by um, Paul Greenwald. Uh, Paul uh, formerly was a U.S. Magistrate Judge for the United States District Court uh, in Northern California. I currently serves as the Chief Legal Officer at Coinbase. On this side of the table, we're, uh, we're very pleased to be joined by Professor Robert Merges. Uh, Professor Merges is a uh, co-founder and co-faculty director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. Uh, and in addition to teaching and research projects, Professor Merges is a co-founder and former managing director of Opidian LLC, uh, Berkeley-based consulting and informatics company specializing in assessing and valuing patent portfolios. Uh, additionally, we're joined by uh, Professor Laura Lee Norris. Uh, Professor Norris is the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Associate Clinical Professor at Santa Clara Law. Uh, additionally, Professor Norris is the founding director of the Entrepreneurs Law Clinic and Tech Edge JD program at Santa Clara University. And last but not least, to my right, we're joined uh, by Professor Mark Lemley. Uh, Professor Lemley is the uh, William H. Newcomb Professor of Law at Stanford Law School and the Director of the Stanford Program in Law, Science, and Technology. So with that, I will turn things over to our Undersecretary of Commerce and Director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, Ms. Kathy Vidal, who will moderate today's panel session. Yeah, Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, I will say, I believe Colleen is here in her capacity as a law, uh, law school professor. Is that right? Or are you? I'm here as a, as in my capacity as a commoner. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I just wanted I wanted to clarify that. So. Um, First of all, I want to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, I want to thank the people in the audience, both here live and remote. Um, this is a this is a great turnout. Um, I want to make sure that we uh, we were able to answer your questions. So, as Steve said, please make sure that you submit them. We did receive a number of them in advance, so thank you for all of that. I also want to thank everybody on the panel. I've had a number of listening sessions so far. I've met with inventors, startup organizations, a governor's office, different countries and their IP offices, universities, et cetera. This is the first time we've brought together this type of group that really represents a lot of different interests. Um, Laura works a lot with startups and, um, and entrepreneurs. And then we've got a number of people who deal with a lot of issues and are considering all stakeholders' input when they think about the law and what it should be and when they do their analysis. So I'm, I'm very thrilled to have this group here and to hear their thoughts uh, based on the questions that were presented and the ones that I'm going to ask as well. To me, this is part of um, a series of listening sessions so that we can hear what's on people's minds and we can get good ideas no matter where they come from. So I just want to make that clear that when, when we're making our decision making, certainly we're going to go out and seek stakeholder input. But if you have it at any time, there's always an email that you can send it to. You can always connect with us because if you've got a good idea, we want to make sure that we're looking at it, we're analyzing it, and we're advancing it. In terms of our vision and mission at the USPTO, we are looking to bring innovation to impact. We want to incentivize and encourage more innovation in every aspect of our society and traditionally underrepresented communities and in our innovation hubs and in our companies. Um, across the board, we want to be there. We want to incentivize it. We want to connect with people. Um, and we especially want to do that in key technology areas. So yesterday, I was at an energy conference talking to a number of entrepreneurs and independent inventors who are developing materials and inventions and innovation in that space to try and solve climate change issues and other issues. So I um, was, was very excited about that. And then, of course, once we have that innovation, the only way we bring it to impact is really to protect it. 
And so I know a lot of the topics we're talking about today are really on those protection mechanisms. You know, making sure that we're protecting the IP in the U.S. and overseas um, so that it can be brought to market, so that people will invest in it. And then in terms of the impact, we're thinking not only of impact like solving world problems, but creating jobs and fostering economic prosperity. There's a reason that the USPTO sits within commerce. That's part of our role to make sure that we're using intellectual property for the good of the people and, and to create economic prosperity. Um, in, in terms of individual objectives, what you're gonna see is that you know, we're focused on reliable and robust patents. We, we're focused on identifying any abuses of the system. Uh, we wanna get back to first principles in terms of what was the, the Patent and Trademark Office initially intended to do? Why do we have patents? Why do we have trademarks? Are they being used for that purpose? And where they're not and where there are abuses, we wanna figure out a way to surgically um, resolve those abuses and, and prevent those abuses in a way that doesn't harm the original intent of the system. So we're really looking for all ideas on that so that we can be very surgical um, on those issues. And that includes everything from decluttering the trademark registry, which I know we're doing in part with the Trademark Modernization Act, any counterfeiting campaigns, you're gonna see some, some new news on that. We're doing that with the, the Gruff the Crime Dog, but we're looking for other avenues and working across agencies to try and um, cut back on counterfeiting. Um, so with that, uh, I wanna to turn to our first topic, which is director review and Fintive uh, NHK. This is the, the PPAP topic. So before I turn to this topic, I wanna to let everybody know that the way we are resolving issues and moving things forward is we're first looking at what can we do soon through an interim process? And then how do we get the right stakeholder input to move things forward and formalize? So you're going to see that across the board. Um, what you've already seen already is we took that approach with director review, that we put a lot more information on our website to provide clarity and transparency into the director review process. We added to that to ask parties to make sure that they're focusing on issues that are really the types of issues the director should be reviewing and that they're ranking their issues so that it makes it easier for us to, to handle those. So we did that by updating a website and then we're gonna go through the formal uh, rulemaking process on that. You're gonna see that with all aspects of PTAB, some of that you're gonna see soon. Um, this session, I'm looking to get uh, you know, other thoughts on how we can improve that. And I will say with the PTAB, just like with everything else, we are going back to first principles. You know, the, the AIA, the, the intent of it in part was to provide a mechanism for resolving invalidity issues short of litigation, short of parties having to spend the resources they spend on litigation. Um, the, another intent was to make sure that if patents had issued, and for example, the PTO was not aware of certain prior art and it came up later that the, P, the PTO can self-monitor and make sure that that patents that were not, you know, should not have been issued or that are valid, um, that, that those are addressed at the PTAB level. So um, with that, um, I wanna ask questions of the panelists. And for this one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with Paul. Um, so one of the audience members, and thank you for whoever submitted this, this comment, said, over the years, it seems that PTAB is making more, fav I mean, becoming more favorable to large companies. What is your view on the PTAB when it comes to independent inventors and small technology companies. So I would ask all the panelists if you could provide your thoughts on that question, as well as what the USPTO can do to achieve the goals of the AIA in the most fair and open manner. Paul? Thank you, Director, and thank you for convening this conversation. I think it's long overdue. Um, as a preliminary matter, I have to also applaud your focus on first principles. So I think when it comes to many topics we're gonna to hit on today, including the PTAB, the return to first principles is, is, is particularly helpful. Um, and, and one element, of course, of first principles applicable to the PTAB and the AI more generally is, what did Congress actually intend? What was the purpose of this new administrative procedure? And I would suggest, and I don't think this is terribly original or controversial, that the purpose of, 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 of the Congress in enacting, creating procedures around the PTAB was to create primacy in the PTAB for resolving many, if not most or all, uh, validity questions um, that are finding their way into litigation. Um, I think there are several aspects of the PTAB procedure, now that we've all had a decade or so of experience with it, that are actually quite um, favorable, or at least equally favorable, 
smaller companies, independent inventors that tend to get overlooked. Um, in my experience, first and foremost, is the availability of technically trained judges. Uh, those uh, appointed to adjudicate disputes who actually have a background and competency in the technical area uh, at issue. Uh, again, it doesn't strike me as a terribly controversial observation, but it, it does seem that as compared to district court litigation, um, there is a real advantage there for patent owners in having their patents evaluated by people competent to understand significant differences. Um, I think the experience uh, over the past decade with limited and focused discovery is also to the advantage of uh, smaller companies, independent inventors, and the like. Um, the cost of litigation typically can be borne much more easily or manageably by larger technology companies. I think PTAS proceedings offer a way of leveling that playing field. Um, at the same time, I think we have now seen a decade or so into this experiment that there are abuses, and there have been um, abuses that need to be addressed. And I think um, the PTAB has worked effectively to address them. And I'm speaking specifically about serial or parallel petitions that just seem to lob attack after attack on the same paths or the same claims over and over again. Uh, I do think that those, uh, uh, those, those, those reforms that are focused on single petitions or limited petitions, limited ground, um, unified proceedings um, when a particular uh, patent is, is challenged are helpful, important, and frankly something that everyone should uh, support, and, and certainly I support uh, as much as I as some. In general, the PTAS proceedings is working very well. I'm going to open it up for other questions or comments from the panel. Do you want to go around, Ellison? Do you want to? Yeah, I, um, I mean, I, I very much agree with what Paul has said, particularly on the issues of technically trained judges and limited and focused discovery. I mean, I think the reality is that leveling the playing field is challenging when you have parties with different financial ability to invest in, in, a, in a particular investigation or in your court. And so one thing that could be considered, you know, if, if it makes sense, um, certainly there's my for entity, um, Examination, you might you might consider for certain entities whether there should be a micro entity way of entering the PTAB. I don't know how often that comes up. I think that that could be a source of study, but that could be a way to, to decrease barriers in that space. Um, I think that that's everything that I would add. Yeah, and I would just comment on that, and then I'll turn it over to Mark, and we'll come come back around the circle. But um, there's no charge for those inventors defending their patent there, so that that certainly is a benefit. Um, to the extent there is a benefit there. Um, but but I, just, I wanted to note that, not because I, I know you all know that, but sometimes we get questions from other stakeholders wondering about the fees that are being charged to small inventors, small enterprises, et cetera. So, but to your point, um, so to the extent there would be a micro entity status, it would be small companies that are maybe challenging the patents of others. Um, and that, that's what you're envisioning, is that? Yeah, I think part of it, and the other way in which I can envision it coming up, I mean, one of the disadvantages for a small patent holder who's going to the PTAB is the scenario where you want to enforce against multiple entities at the same time. I mean, this report is just more efficient in that way, but it can be significantly more expensive. That could be another scenario where something like that could come up to help with efficiency in that way. That, that's great. And one other thing I do want to mention is um, we're going to talk about pro bono later, but there is now a pro bono program for the PTAB. So I think that's going to be another way where we can help small inventors and small companies or inventors and small companies. Mark? Uh, yeah, all right. On the on the sort of small entity issue, I mean, I think the answer is on balance the PTAB is is great, right? Because it reduces the cost of litigation by an order of magnitude, right? And that's good for everybody except a small class of people who benefit from the cost of the litigation system. Um, I guess as a patent litigator, maybe I'm in that small category, <laughs> but um, uh, but, I, but I think as a general matter, right, that's a good thing. That doesn't mean there aren't sort of equities that we need to try to work out, right? Um, uh, and I think one thing that's worth noting is the effort to try to create a, a small claims enforcement procedure at the PTO, which is something that I applaud, um, right, as a, as a way to sort of reduce costs on the enforcement side as well. In, in the practice and in the sort of decade that we've um, had the PTO, I wanted to sort of focus a little bit of attention on the 
uh, on some of the recent moves around FinTiv and um, uh, and sort of changes in how the board has taken cases. Uh, so the board started out taking a lot of cases and invalidating a lot of patents, in part because there was a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. Uh, those numbers then declined until by about 2016 or 2017, the uh, invalidation rate was essentially the same as it was in litigation. Right? So it wasn't sort of more or less um, uh, uh, effective, uh, more or less pro-patentee than, uh, than litigation. Um, in the last administration, in part because of uh, uh, fintive, right, and discretionary denials uh, going through the roof, in part, I think, also probably because of the SAS decision and the sort of increasing challenge to the board of uh, once you've opened a patent uh, inquiry, you've got to sort of do the whole thing. Um, we saw those, uh, we saw institutions drop dramatically, and so the overall invalidation rate actually dropped uh, uh, to substantially below uh, where it is in court, uh, which is interesting. I think the, um, I, I think the problem with fintive and discretionary denials is in part um, uh, a procedural problem. Uh, so there are circumstances in which it makes sense to deny uh, on discretionary basis, uh, but, the, but we've set up the system in such a way that uh, you've essentially now got to pre-brief the issue of whether or not there will be a discretionary offensive denial in every case using very limited uh, page uh, uh, available to you even though it now comes up in a relatively small percentage of cases, and even though one of the studies that we've done at the Stanford Entity Status Database shows um, there are eight PTAB judges who are responsible for 40% of defensive denial. Right? This seems to be very much a kind of concentrated in a few judges. Um, so I think one thing you could do is you could actually uh, uh, sort of cabin off Fintiv and say, this is something that can be briefed if and only if there's a, there's a real challenge that's brought that says, here's why you should engage in a discretionary denial. Uh, the other thing I think that we've seen which you could um, uh, usefully uh, respond to is uh, one of the reasons for the increase in denials has been the role of uh, judges like Judge Albright in the Western District of Texas who say, I'm going to take all of my cases to trial in a year, uh, and the PTAB then says, well, we won't be done for a year, so I guess we should just wait. Um, Judge Albright is not going to take all of these cases to trial in a year. He currently has about 900. Um, uh, they're not all going to trial. The evidence when they do go to trial is it's more like two or three years in line with the other district judges. And the federal circuit in a number of mandamus grants has recognized that fact and said, we shouldn't pay attention to when have you set your nominal trial date, we should pay attention to what's the actual record of how long it takes you to get to trial. Having the board do something like that and not merely back away because a judge says, I'm going to go to trial fast and I'm not going to stay my case, I think would help kind of balance Ventive on the, on the issues where there really is a need for discretionary funds. So I appreciate that, Mark, and I will say we are, just, just like I had mentioned earlier, we are looking at Tinted and all of that with this interim long-term strategy. So you are going to see some things come out soon that I think will provide uh, some clarity and some, it will address some of the concerns and thoughts that have been expressed over time. Um, so, so thank you for that. Um, I had not heard about the, the proposal of doing brief, brief it if and only if. Um, I like that, and I'll just say to everyone, when people give us concrete proposals, it's easier to digest them and act on them. So it, it's great if you think certain areas need to be looked into. We're also responding to that kind of feedback. But if you have specific feedback, this is to everyone physically here in the audience, et cetera, uh, please let us know. We, we're, we're really, um, we want to absorb all those ideas and figure out what makes sense either to put in something interim or if it's something where we think there may be controversy, then at least it, it'll help us shape how we do a request for comment. What kind of, and, and we will always have an open-ended um, question in case you want to provide the feedback later, but to the extent we know of the great ideas sooner rather than later, we can filter them into that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to note here is that um, on the small claims procedure within the USPTO, there, there has been a study commission. Um, I, I don't know if everybody knows that. They are looking right now, I just found this out today, they're looking for a, a consulting group to work with that study and to provide comments within that study. So if you have thoughts or ideas on who should be in that consulting group, please, in the comment section, if you're on video or on your card, feel free to make those suggestions. I'd like it to be balanced. I'd like to make sure that independent inventors are involved in that as well because they're the ones who are going to use the process or people who work with a lot of independent inventors and have their 
um, you know, their interests in mind, um, as well as other stakeholders. So um, de definitely let us know if you have suggestions or thoughts or if you think you'd be particularly um, good at that. All I can do is make recommendations into the process. The study is going to, you know, they're going to pick the people at the end of the day, but I would, would be happy to get thoughts on that. Laura. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'll say first off, and, and part of me, uh, part of my, I teach design thinking as well to, to lawyers. So I think um, part of part of going back to first principles, I think, is if you want to take a system and figure out um, are there inequities in how the system is working right now, first principles um, go and survey and talk to the folks that have been involved in the system and really understand what they perceive the inequities to be, right? So, um, and to the extent that the USPTO has not already done that, that that's you know a, a step that you can take immediately um, to find out what people who have been in the system have to say about it. And then um, secondly, I'm gonna make a point which actually just um, leads to the small claims idea, and I think that's a wonderful idea, um, and that is, I deal with a lot of companies that are not publicly traded, that um, have, you know, are private companies that have um, funding from sources where they have to account for all the money that they're spending, and spending a bunch of money on a lot of lawyers to enter a system, even if it's the PTAB, as opposed to litigation, just isn't tenable. And, and so it may be that you take, um, you know, federal court litigation and you step it down. PTAB is so much less expensive, but it's still a, a really large bar for folks that really want to spend all their money on building product and growing their customer base and scaling. So, um, so finding a way to um, allow people that are in that situation to avail themselves of the PTAB would be a, a, a wonderful thing to do. And that could be either through pro bono or when we get into talking about pro bono, I have some other ideas there, but it could either be in access to competent counsel in the PTAB, let's just call it that, as opposed to only pro bono. But then also um, something like a small claims or a faster, cheaper way of availing themselves. Because I do deal with um, quite a few companies where they may get approached by uh, someone to, to take a license, they believe that there's a chance the patent might be invalid, but they're going to take the license. They're just going to take the license, even though they may be able to go to the PTAB um, and, and have some relief that way. Perfect. Rob? Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for inviting me, and uh, welcome everybody who, uh, who who turned out. I've just got a couple points about the whole PTAB system. First of all, um, I think, you know, your your job, uh, Director Vidal, is like, you know, to see the whole system. And as you know, not everybody can win. And it does disparately impact, um, you know, a, a small inventor, small company, uh, when they lose at the PTAB or when their patent is rejected. The patent system uh, on an individual basis can seem random, and can seem unfair. But obviously your job is to look at the total picture and in the aggregate, the patent system, you know, tends to do a pretty good job. But that means that some individual people will lose. No one ever said the system was completely fair because, as you know, it has a lot of what seem like arbitrary rules at times. You know, you can put your life savings into a fantastic invention and somebody who wrote a master's thesis and put it in a library in Europe can kill your whole patent. You know, where's the fairness there? Or you file one day later than somebody else in the old interference. So, in the aggregate, it's fair, but you you know you're going to have people who have bad outcomes. That's part of the design of the system. So I start with that. Um, as for little companies and startups, they, they are absolutely crucial for economic development for our economy. They're just it's hard to, to overvalue them. But as I say, you know each individual patent and each individual inventor and small company, that patent and that 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 patent portfolio that they're trying to build, that's their whole nest egg. That's everything. You know. And to them, um, that's the most important patent in the world. Uh, I, I do think that, that the system structurally, and Mark can tell you this, it's, it's, it's not fair. It, it, it resource intensity helps you prevail in any patent conflict. You know, money helps win. That's just the way it is. One way to help smaller companies, it seems to me, is to maybe get the office of the chief economist to do a study because we know that prevailing in an IPR, if you're the patent owner, is a big gives you a big bump in valuation. Prevailing gives you a semi gold plated patent. Obviously, not not completely defensible against all attacks, but it's an enhanced uh, patent. Studying the degree to which winning an IPR helps you 
increased value might help capital formation, might help investors say, I, I'll help you survive an IPR because there's something in it for me. And that would offload some of the costs from the, you know, the Visa card of the individual startup person. The other thing that might be looked into is, you know, maybe some system of awarding attorney fees for um, outrageous or egregious or aggressive IPR, uh, use of IPRs or the, or the PTAB process as a way to prevent harassment. Reversing the American rule can sometimes help, although, as anybody will tell you, it comes with, with downsides. In the big picture, it seems to me we have we have two uh, major, uh, I think, sort of problems that have emerged with IPRs. One is, in some fields, the technical rules of real party and interest and estoppel and claims versus grounds and all that allows people to gang up on a patent. I know Genentech had 16 different attacks on one of its patents last year, year before. Some some whittling down of the ability to attack a patent after a certain number of bona fide attacks, something approaching what we, you know, in trademark law, incontestability. It's not true incontestability, but enhanced status or some kind of raised bar for institution after the third bona fide attack might prevent ganging up. It's worth thinking about. Now, you'll, you'll have all kinds of technical objections. Um, because the, the rules of estoppel, the rules of, of collateral estoppel, et cetera, those were developed in the district court context where due process is the absolute top priority. It shouldn't be the top priority in a PTAB proceeding. Keep it cheap, keep it simple. That will not always give you a, a, an opportunity to provide absolutely full due process. Too bad. It's not the last stop on the train. Keep it simple, keep it cheap. I would like to see a sort of one-shot rule, a very broad estoppel and a very broad set of principles. You've got one shot. You're smart. You do your, your prior art research. You come in with your best shot. Don't slice it and dice it to create 16 different attacks on a patent. On the other side, we see the end run strategy, which is uh, not that we want to overuse IPR, but we want to avoid them, right? And so we see games that are going on allowing an end run. And, and I think Fintiv is, is not a, an acceptable policy. It's inconsistent with the spirit of the AIA and some of the district courts, you know, the Texas district courts, as Mark said, playing this game of, of well, I'm going to resolve it faster than an IPR. Um, you know, we can't sanction a judge, but if we could, <laughs> anyway, dot, dot, dot. The point is that's inconsistent with what the AIA is trying to, is trying to do. We want to channel cases into the AIA because as several panelists have said, it's cheaper and we have expert tribunal it's one of the best innovations in the patent system. It's an innovation that has put the U.S. in consistent shape with the rest of the world. Around the world, we have three stages in the life of a patent. We have the prosecution and grant, we have an opposition, and then we have litigation. And that's where we were headed. That middle stage is crucial for patent quality and for making the patent system affordable. Because as Mark said, an order of magnitude less to invalidate a patent is a very important policy objective. So it's being attacked from both sides. Now, maybe there's a deal to be had, right? You stop ganging up, pharma, and you stop end running trolls, and maybe a technical corrections bill can fix both. Uh, Rob, can I just make a suggestion? I mean, I, I think I agree with all of that. I, the, the, the one place it seems to me that the ability to have a discretionary denial that's unreviewable is useful, right, is precisely in the kind of multiple uh, bites at the apple cases. Right, and so we have, rather than rather yeah, yeah. than you know, will there be a ju district judge who could race me to get there first? If the focus yeah. of the of the fintive uh, was on, is this the, not the first challenge, yeah. but the th fourth or the fifth challenge? Right, um, right uh, to this patent. I agree. Right. Friendly amendment. Don't call it discretionary. Right. Say that's the channeling rule, and it's dictated by the structure. Not it's up to you. Not a whim. Not a if I feel like it. But if if a certain factors are met. Then you right. Although I think you need some room for consolidation, right? I mean, they, I think it's an easy case if it's my fifth challenge to your patent, right? Right. It's a, hard, but, but, it's a somewhat harder case if you well, just sued me, and it turns out that five years ago somebody else challenged your patent. I but know, but it, these informal patent challenge clubs, you know, that's where the RPO rules become, I think, a barrier because we all know there's a lot of, you know, behind the scenes coordination going on, as you know. So and I, and, and I absolutely agree. Yeah. Anyway, with I'll offer a friendly amendment. <laughs> I also think a path to meaningful director review on institution decisions could also be very useful. 
So thank you. This, this is a very, very productive discussion, and I appreciate that. I will say on anything that is a perceived abuse, we are going to look into that very closely. And uh, when we're thinking about the tests that are being applied, where there does make sense to have bright line rules, I believe in bright line rules where it makes sense. I also know that you know, we, we all know the abuses that happen in district court. And to some extent, people are just now thinking about the way they can they can game the, the PTAB for the same purpose. And so that's something that, you know, sometimes you can have a bright line rule and sometimes we just need to figure out how, you know, look at the fact patterns as they emerge and try and figure out if people are using this for the purpose for which it was intended or if they're using it for some private game that, that should not be a, a use of the system. So I uh, appreciate all the comments on all of that. Um, by the way, we do not have a clock here. We have four clocks against the back wall. 1036. None of which I can see. So how much time do we have left? Uh, it's 1036. We are currently, we, we get We're six minutes behind. Six minutes but, behind our current schedule. Let's move to the next stop. Okay, and, and then the end time is? 1130. 11. Perfect, okay. So, so just want to make sure we cover all the great topics. Did you have something, Colleen? Just one thing to explore. There's been so much interest in right? So on um, the small claims court, um, the Administrative Conference of the U.S. is working with the PTO to solicit your comments and input on the topic. And so the comments have to be received by July 6th. And it would be really wonderful to see a lot of engagement on this question. They don't specifically call the question of invalidation and how it should be dealt with in that forum, but um, I think that would be a particularly interesting and and that's a really good point, Colleen. We'll make sure we put that out there as well on all of our channels so that people know that they do have the ability to, to comment. I think the other thing is just in terms of commenting, but also if anybody else has any thoughts, you know, the PTO has continued to evolve we have, as it moves along. And so there have been changes made in the last few years around amendment practice, around the material petition. So to the extent people have opinions, either on the panel or others, about how those changes have actually changed uh, the dynamic or other market-based changes that are really causing this perception and this reality that independent venture small companies are feeling that there's advantage. Uh, it would really be helpful for us to understand that. Yeah, agree. So if anybody has comments, there are, so, so you can use the tools that you have, whether it's the note cards if you're in the room or whether it's the chat section, um, not only to ask questions of the panel. I know those are going to be funneled through Colleen and she'll ask um, questions as they come in um, where it makes sense. But also, if you do have ideas, if you do have thoughts, or if you don't know how to connect up with the USPTO, because we have a lot of emails that you can use to provide your comments, to provide your thoughts, and we want to hear feedback. So um, just want to make sure that everybody has access to that. And again, just before the PTO, again, does so many different things and has a lot of initiatives. Concrete feedback on what is done already can be really useful, because I think all these conversations, all these perspectives are it's really important to be taking into account there have been actions taken, so thank you back on uh, Just a quick comment on that. I'll, I'll turn my microphone on, which surprised me. Uh, we, we actually do have some people, you know, uh, in the IP system who do relatively inexpensive, high-volume um, IP dispute resolution. You know, what I'm talking about is, is the crew at Amazon and the crew at eBay. They've got... Um, you know, in a sense, informal small claims court type procedures, I just would suggest tapping into their expertise because they've already tackled this problem. Now, obviously, they're private companies, and you're going to have a different perspective, but I think they may have some experience that could be helpful. Well, that's a good idea, even as the USPTO makes recommendations on who should be in this consulting group that they can tell with people there. So uh, definitely appreciate that. Um, and, and I will say, just on topics, I know we're only discussing a few topics today, but there are a lot of other things that we are working on at the USPTO. Helene mentioned amendment practice. That's something we're looking into um, you know, for, for the PTAB. We're also really focused on patent quality and any, any good ideas on that. Now is the time to, to chime in on anything related to that. So please don't feel like your comments need to be limited to what we're discussing today. This was just shaped around the feedback that we got ahead of time. And on that feedback, the next topic is subject matter eligibility um, or 101. Um, you know, certainly it's very important for our systems we get back to first principles that the law be clear and, um, and applied fairly. And I think within the 101, you know, with, with subject matter eligibility, that's not the case. I'll just leave it at that. And so um, I, I don't know if everybody saw it, but the American Axel brief uh, was filed um, on behalf of the solicitor and the USPTO, so people can take a look at that. Certainly ways that we can impart more clarity into 101 are either with the Supreme Court, through legislation, and even with the USPTO's own guidance on this. So I, I am all in favor of the USPTO providing guidance wherever we can 
so that different um, patent examiners are applying the same standards across the board and so that the laws are clear. So um, if you have any thoughts on the guidance, I welcome that. I'm going to, um, one other thing before I turn it over to the panel is we, we are going to release a report on 101 soon. It's the report that deals with do the current laws incentivize innovation? Are they working for their intended purpose? So we did do a survey on that. We received comments on that. We're going to, we're going to publish that soon. But to the panelists, um, what role can the USPTO play? And this is, remember, we can, we can chime in on, um, obviously we, we, we were part of the brief that went in uh, to the Supreme Court. We can get involved in bills and then we've got the guidance. But what role can we play in bringing greater consistency to subject matter eligibility determinations both during and after examination? And for this one, I'll start with Mark. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I, so look, I, I think, I mean, there are, there are two concepts that perhaps ought to be disambiguated, right? I think there are people who want greater clarity in 101 because 101 starts out as a mess and it's still uh, still kind of a mess, uh, although I think less so than it used to be. And there are people who want 101 to change, right? And those two things often get conflated. Uh, you can want both of those things, right? But um, uh, but from the PTO's perspective, right? I think what you have to think about is, well, all right, what's the law as it stands right now and how do we actually implement that law uh, in granting patents, um, even if the goal is also to change the law? Um, I, the law might change. Uh, I think the, with the sort of SG's brief, the odds of a grant in American Act will go up. I think if the court gets American Axel, it will look at this and quite correctly say, that's the sort of thing that should be patentable. The court, the federal circuit screwed this up. Um, I don't think, though, that they're going to look at this and say, boy, this is a sign that all of our last four decisions were a mistake. Those were all unanimous, all the all, absent Bilkey were unanimous decisions, right? And actually in direction, all unanimous, I think, um, right? The, uh, I don't think they're going to say 101 is just going to go away. Right, so um, one thing we could do is sort of wait and see what the law turns out to be if the court takes American Axel. People have been waiting for a long time, I think, in hopes that, well, the court will realize its mistake or change Alice or do all of these things. I don't think that you should assume that's going to happen. So the question then is, what do you do with it? Um, I do think the Federal Circuit case law, for the most part, and with exceptions, and American Axel is one of those exceptions, right, has gradually kind of wound its way, not to a line, I don't think there is a line, I'm not sure there ever would be a line, but to a kind of rough judgment that if it feels like there's real technology in here, this is an encryption invention, right, it's going to survive 101. If it feels like what you've done is take some basic concept and put it in a computer, it's not going to survive 101. Selling pet food over the internet, right, isn't going to survive 101. That's not a great line. I'm not sure it's terribly satisfactory, but I think it's kind of where the federal circuit uh, case law has gravitated. One of the things that's notable to me is wherever you find that exact cluster of lines, the 2019 PTO guidelines are way outside that cluster. Right? They take a very strong position that says, you know what, as long as you've got an implementation of an abstract idea, you get a patent, end of story. Uh, I don't think that's consistent with uh, Alice and Mayo. Uh, I don't think it's consistent with where the Federal Circuit is right now. Uh, and so the question is, what do you do about it? I, I understand kind of the desire to move the law in that direction. Maybe there's a desire to sort of predict that the law will move in that direction, and in which case we'll say, okay, see, we were right all along. Um, and it may even be okay that we're granting a bunch of people patents which would fail if they ever got challenged in court, uh, right? Because a lot of the things people use a patent for don't involve enforcing them in court, right? And so maybe people are happy to have a patent uh, that they can use in their business, that they can use for licensing and so forth, um, uh, even if, uh, if it came down to it, that patent would not survive under current federal circuit law. But it makes me a little nervous that, to just kind of like, sort of grant patents out there to the world, right, that we know, in fact, are granted under a legal uh, standard that wouldn't survive in court if it ever got to that point, right? And so I feel like we're, 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 we're kind of misleading people a little bit if you're handing them a patent and saying, okay, well, this is, this is a patent under our guidelines, but it's not a patent that's likely to survive under the current case. So I appreciate that. And I will say we are looking at the 101 guidance just like we're, we're looking at anything and everything. So if anybody has concrete thoughts on it, and I've invited Mark as well, give me a red line as to what you think it should say. Um, but welcome that from everyone. So uh, as we take a look at that, we'd love to explore how we can keep guidance in place 
so we can provide more certainty and clarity and at the same time um, make sure that it's achieving the purpose that, that we hope that it's going to achieve. Um, Laura? Uh, yeah, so going back again to, um, uh, I, I tend to uh, work with companies that are at the stage of, of trying to get patents, so I'll focus on that of the stage of actually getting patents. Um, so much of the um, chaos around 101 is all about how claims are constructed, um, and so are there ways that the USPTO might be able to um, help to better educate and train the patent bar and partner with organizations that do educate and train the patent bar um, just to ensure that people understand more concrete examples and maybe that's in the guidance and, and maybe that's also in some other sorts of training and awareness. But, um, you know, are there certain um, claims or, or, or a variety of claims that should be that should be put in the application and um, do the folks that are writing patent applications for software claims really understand the history and the ups and downs and where potentially the Federal Circuit might go next. And, and if people better understood that, would there be a potential that the claims might might be might might withstand challenges? I, I appreciate that. And to your point about making sure that we give, you know, we have resources, especially for the people who don't necessarily have the uh, the access that others might have. Uh, we did launch this week a, a website that provides a lot of different resources. It provides ways for lawyers to connect into our pro bono program. It provides resources to individual um, inventors, to small uh, enterprises, so that we can connect them more with the materials that we've already created. But we are working on more materials in Europe. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, that, is, that is something that's very important to the USPTO, that we meet people where they are, that we use plain language, that we try and explain to everyone what all their rights are and how they can protect their innovations and, and register their trademark. Rob? Yeah, so, um, I, I, uh, I, I think, I, I wish that I could agree that the Federal Circuit cases are, are moving toward um, uh, some, some kind of vague certainty, but when I compare some of the cases um, that I'm aware of, you know, the, the Ariosa case and the, the Duo Technology case, both of which I think are significant improvements in technology, but which were balanced under 101, and then I go to a software case like the MCRO case on, on the, the lip syncing automation software. And then I compare it to American Axle. I mean, I, I think maybe if, if, if Mark would say American Axle is, is sort of an outlier and Macro case, the, 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 the animation case, is more in the main trend, I would say, yeah, we're on the, we're on the right path. But I've just seen cases like the Apple camera case that are, that are also similar to American Axle that to me, differ from the MCRO case. So I, I don't. I wish I could see some long-term convergence, but I'm having a hard time with it. In terms of concrete guidance, one of the suggestions I think you made in the proposal was when you write the next set of guidelines, you're going to talk about levels of abstraction. You're going to talk about um, why a certain claim violates 101, why it's unpatentable. And I would really suggest. I mean, I have my students do this. You know, write some hypothetical claims that are, you know, first of all, obviously a violation of 101, you know, a method of selling dog food on the internet, classic, you know, completely invalid under Alice and Bilski. And then you move to a more functional plan, you know, a module, an ordering module, and a customer check module, you know, the sort of nonce word, black box kind of functional claim. And then you move down and try to actually write a claim that's patentable under 101, you know, that has more concrete limitations. And I think if you do that in the guidelines, if you not only say this claim is invalid, but also this one would be valid based on the same specification or based on this invention, you're going to give people more guidance. And at a minimum, you might get them to think harder about dependent claims and say, okay, I'm running the risk that my broadest claim is going to be a problem, and that's my job to extrapolate from an embodiment and get the broadest claim I can. That's the way a lot of prosecutors think. But then give them some safe harbors, you know, show some examples of more concrete hardware limitations and, you know, less functional claiming that you think would be valid so that in the same guidance where you say this one's no good, you give some examples of how could you claim this same invention in a way that would satisfy one. Without affirmative guidance, I think you're just, you know, sending more sort of shots in the dark. 
And I would say that, you know, in a big picture, the idea that we're converging on a sort of technical content test, that's a reasonable reading of where we might want to go. And that would make the U.S., you know, consistent with the, the EPO, which has a technical effects test, and with the Chinese National IP Office, which uses a technical solution to a technical problem that has technical features test, all of which is really getting at, we just need to show that you're claiming technology and not, not vaporware, you know, but when making it concrete in the examples could help. Thanks, Rob. Allison? Okay. Pick up Paul. Are you challenging my algorithm here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my comment that we sort of heard and what Rob said. Um, I mean, I, I think that from an enforcement perspective, post Mayo and Allen's enforcement is largely case law based, and I think that that's where some of the disparities that we're seeing between what you're getting from the guidance and what you're actually seeing in medication are coming from. I mean, the reality is that in a lot of cases, the briefing will just be a comparison to whatever case the parties seem to think is closest. I think federal judges who recognize that, just in North America and the District of Delaware, when they do 101 days, one of the questions they both have on their on their uh, order is to identify the case closest. That's kind of where we're at right now because of the confusion and a lot of what we're talking about. So. I would also like to see in a, in a revision of the guidance more examples. I think the idea of putting hypotheticals is great. Watching claims convert from something that would be invalid to valid. I think it. I understand why the current guidance is more rules based because you want to ensure consistency and how these factors are being applied. But I think to the extent that more examples can be added without being overwhelming, you know. Step two, talking about examples or combinations and those features were found in the container and that those kinds of things could be really helpful. And frankly, it would be really useful for practitioners as well. It's obviously not the primary mission, but practitioners would appreciate that. I think that also training that goes along with the guidance for the examiners is going to be really important. I think that training can be adapted for the community. A couple of other options, which I think would be slightly more challenging to implement, but I'm going to throw them out there. And you might consider designating specialists within the art units that are receiving most of the 101 challenges, software, diagnostics, that kind of a thing, who are really focused on 101 determination. It's going to be easier for them to keep up if they're receiving most of these cases. You know, and the statistics are, you know, you're not seeing a 101 challenge in that, you know, even in, even in these art units. You're not necessarily seeing it in every application. And so, you know, having some sort of consistency from pooling could be an option. You could even have examiners flag the 101 issue for determination separately. That would be something you could consider. You also could have a specialized PTAP panel for appeal term examination on 101 to sort of solidify and create consistency in that way. But I think more than anything, I would be, I, th I think that the, you know, the revision on the guidance is the place that I would recommend starting. Great. Paul? Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think I'm going to leave substance on one on one to the other. I think we've heard some good suggestions there. Maybe that's just my ducking and avoiding the best that we've seen over the last 10 or more years. Um, I do think it's very important, regardless of the uh, convergence of the federal circuit case law at the moment, uh, regardless of the fact we may see some further guidance in the Supreme Court, that you and your position offer guidance to practitioners and to the market. Whatever, whatever that guidance may be, I cannot underscore enough. The, the virtue and value of having a clear line of sight as to how you are thinking about these issues. Um, and it's really, really important in terms of making efficient capital allocation decisions within companies to understand sort of where the current thinking of, 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 of the office is. Um, and of course, ideally, we would like to see that in alignment with the emerging trends of the Supreme Court. Maybe we'll get some clarity, maybe we won't. But I do think that clarity is super, super important procedural. So I wouldn't wait. This is my, my respectful suggestion to you in that regard. Um, in terms of, 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 in terms of, of uh, practical solutions, I do think that empowering examiners to, uh, to understand the case law um, and to be more effective in pattern matching is, is very, very critical. I do think what we're seeing, whether it's in the uh, district court litigation and some of the decisions from the office, um, or, or, or in the academic literature, it's a constant pattern matching process that we're all undertaking. Um, in, in, that, in that vein, you know, um, I do think technology could be helpful here. Um, a couple of years ago, 
the PTO uh, did explore the use of AI and tooling for examiners uh, with respect to patent searches. I think there's an opportunity to explore that same opportunity, that same type of um, technical assistance for examiners here. Um, so, so that would be one concrete suggestion I would make. Um, perhaps an RFI might be the way to go about that to understand what tools might be available um, that would allow for greater pattern matching. I also think that um, to, to AI tooling and systems could also be useful to uh, identify whether there are anomalies across the examiner core when it comes to 101 um, that ought to be explored and where it may be appropriate or more appropriate to consider um, piling uh, a, a, a process whereby a certain subset of examiners focus on 101, even if not exclusively. This is such a hard area. Of course, many, 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 there are many, many hard areas that, that examiners are dealing with, but I do think that some concentration or some developed expertise on 101 could, could move them in a meaningful way. Paul, I just want to note that if you can develop an AI that will determine which things are patentable under 101 and which aren't, that should be patentable. That should be patentable. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So the next topic we're going to move to is inclusive innovation. Um, that is something that's really critical to everything that we're doing. And by inclusive innovation, it's really about just making sure that everybody has access to the innovation ecosystem and that we're meeting people where they are um, and that we're doing it inclusively. So certainly we have the Council for Inclusive Innovation that I vice chair through the Secretary of Commerce chairs. You're going to see a lot of activity around that. Uh, we are also looking at the bar requirements for being a member of the patent bar. Should it be the same if you're just if you're doing design patents and you're not doing utility patents? Should you have to be a member of the bar in order to practice before the PTAP? So these are all the questions we're asking ourselves and that we're going to look into and get stakeholder input on uh, with the whole idea that you know we, we need everything to be inclusive, both within the PTO, within the people who practice before the PTO, and we want to make sure that we're supporting inclusive innovation across the board. So with that, I will um, first turn to Laura, and we can maybe do a little bit more rapid fire on this one in terms of do you have any ideas on how, how we can advance this objective? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, uh, I'll just say there's a, there's a few different um, themes that came out of a study that I did. I did a study in 2020 and 2021 where we engaged with 73 different companies, in-house IT managers at the companies, to uncover diversity and innovation best practices. And we were focusing on what can companies do within their company to ensure that the individuals of the company that were engaging in the innovation and invention process reflected the diversity of their population. Um, and we're continuing to work on that, I'll say, and, and my colleague Colleen and I are, are planning a conference for this fall on um, actually um, deploying some diversity pilots and measuring impact through some um, very specifically um, designed processes in-house. Um, but three of the things that we uncovered that came up over and over again within our study um, were, were um, deployed in-house and appear to be working, even though some may not be measurable. And they would be, I think, just as applicable to the USPTO in its, in its, um, um, in, in its uh, outreach. Uh, the first is one of the things that, that people grappled with was figuring out who they could connect with, like how to reach the diverse populations within their own um, companies. And ways that they did that was partnering with employee infinity groups uh, employee research uh, uh, resource groups. And so the USPTO could definitely do the same. I know you're doing some of that already, but certainly that's a way to engage with populations that might not otherwise engage with the USPTO and its processes. Secondly, um, how to make the concept of being an inventor accessible to those populations, because uh, a lot of folks told us that the population that they were trying to engage with didn't see themselves in the term inventor that inventor to them was back in their grade school textbooks, Eli Whitney and the Cotton Gin or something like that, right, and not them. Um, and so some of the things that folks did was change the way that they talked about inventions instead of calling them inventions, calling them innovations or development. Did you engage in creating, in developing, and if so, tell us about that. Um, and another thing they did was really try to publicize the diverse inventors and tell their stories. And so obviously that's something that the PTO does now might be able to improve on doing. And then the third theme that we saw was how to support the diverse 
uh, inventors in entering the process and actually submitting inventions, right? And so creating mentoring and sponsorship opportunities with people that were familiar with the process. Um, and again, that might be something that the USPTO may be able to do, not only with potential inventors that aren't finding their way to the USPTO, but also potentially with diverse uh, potential members of the patent bar. I'm still writing great, great ideas, and I look forward to engaging with you and Colleen on this topic and, and connecting you with Bismarck, who leads our affinity groups. I've already had a meeting with all of our affinity groups. I've already had multiple meetings with Bismarck. You may be tired of hearing from me, but I completely agree that that's part of the solution and would love to hear you know more in-depth details on what you're doing and how we can engage together to, to solve for this. Um, Rob? <clears throat> yeah, um, first, I, I want to say that this idea of sort of democratizing the patent system is not new. That's the foundational principle of the U.S. patent system. Uh, I finished working on a book, uh, American Patent Law, the Business and Economic History. I just put it to bed. It's coming out one of these years. Um, and when I look into it and, and read the literature, that's a distinctive characteristic of the U.S. patent system. The Patent Office was housed in the in the Interior Department along with the General Land Office. And when I was doing this history, I realized that the um, the approach of allocating the federal land was similar to the theory of the patent system in the early days, which is every little person you know can get a claim on this federal resource. Everybody has a right to get in the door. And then your hard work and your initiative and obviously a certain amount of luck. We'll, 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 we'll tell the rest of the tale. But as compared to overseas patent systems, the U.S. patent fees were much lower historically, and it was a much more diverse inventive class after the very earliest days where you had the Fultons of the world and Eli Whitney, you know, well-connected people. After that, in the Jacksonian period, it was a very um, democratic system. So it's nothing new. And I would say, you know, to people who've gotten the idea of reified you know, inventors, they're, they're off base historically. Most inventions are pretty prosaic and were done by fairly average people historically. Uh, second point is that I think you, I would like to see the PTO be aggressive in outreach, but also to separate outreach from its core function. I think we have to be careful to uh, not to mix up our advocacy, which is we want to cultivate inventors all over with the core function. Every single application is going to be treated the same. And as I said before, it's not always fair. You may have a great idea. And, and somebody in Paraguay had that idea 12 years ago, and that's the way it breaks. Um, so if you separate outreach, which is just let's get as many people in the system as we can, from the core function, I think that'll keep it safer because you don't want to start arguing about, you know, disparate impact or your standards are different, or in this one case, you know, the result doesn't seem right. I think you've got to have outreach, but you've got to protect the core function, which is, again, the aggregate. You know, point of view. Last point, okay, how do you do outreach? The example that I would look to would be the Agriculture Department, which did a great job of building agricultural extension offices, going to farmers where they were and sharing state-of-the-art information, getting them access to this big body of scientific research and, and expertise, but bringing it to them. And I think in the same vein, you know, I would say like the Detroit Patent Office is a great maybe exemplar. Let's go to where some creative people are and have it underserved. The ag extension model is let's go to where the farmers are. Let's go to where, where they are. You know, so you have ag extension offices in Oklahoma and, and Idaho and here in California in the Central Valley. In the same way, you know, what are the frontier areas where we think there is some untapped potential? You know, Chicago, Brooklyn, you name the Baltimore, you name the places that, that would come to mind and you say that should be a priority to make sure that we're bringing the best um, um, access to people that we want to serve and that maybe have been underserved, not maybe have been underserved, right? But, but the point is I think if you, if you set it up so that outreach is a separate function and it's a funnel into the system, but once you cross over into the, into the core function, um, Everybody's treated the same because that's the way the patent system, the only way the patent system can be defended. But it was my thoughts. So I appreciate that, Robin. Absolutely, they're separated. I just I want to make that clear in case anybody thinks that that's a future goal or anything like that. All of the outreach 
um, falls within that first channel. So it, you know, innovation to impact where protection is in the middle. And so the outreach is in the first channel, which is all of our regional offices that are doing the outreach. Separately and apart, we do have PTAB judges, examining attorneys, examiners in those offices. They don't report into the outreach structure at all. They report directly into the business units that do the protecting. So even from a functional, um, our functional mechanisms separate them. And even to talk about them, all of the outreach is to bring more people into the pool to give them access to information. And even with that, the goal initially was to make sure that we're getting out there and giving people more access. I want to get that access into the big companies too. If we can create collateral to incentivize innovation, to incentivize um, inclusive innovation, I think the collateral we can create can go to YMCA's, can go to small business associations, can go to large companies, that we want more innovation everywhere. And I think that's what's really going to, to, to make the country rise. But you're right, as soon as that innovation comes into the PTO, there, it, it's a blind system. There's no, there's no trying to figure out how to manipulate the system at all. Like it's a completely different channel. Yeah, I just say, I mean, the, the, the sort of private law function of a patent is extremely important to small companies and individual inventors. But remember, the social cost of an invalid patent, no matter how virtuous the owner, is the same. Yeah. No matter how uh, wonderful the owner is or the small businesses or what they're doing, an invalid patent is an invalid patent, and that's the fundamental job of the patent office, to make sure we're not living under you know, the, the umbrella of a lot of invalid patents, because the social cost there just isn't worth it. One question at the intersection of both your comments about uh, the question of how well the market technology is functioning right now respect to licensing of patents, and that's something you've obviously written and thought a lot about. Do you see that also as a lever for inclusion, improvement of the ability of the PTO to support licensing, and do you think there are Sure. A couple, I mean, a couple, I think licensing in general is just undervalued in our legal system. Most of the case law is, you know, antitrust oriented. Oh, you're using your patent to leverage. We often don't 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 see the benefits, but the benefits are absolutely essential for, for little guys, small companies. The only way they can often commercialize and make money, they don't have the money to build a factory, licensing is key. So some of the pro bono outreach should be help, not just in getting the patent, but in deploying it, you know? And I think the courts can help too by reversing a kind of negative attitude toward licensing. Um, you know, we see it in the Supreme Court. I think that this, this, this Minerva case on Aston or Estoppel is a, is a fair recognition that private law arrangements around patents are important. They're not the only important value, and I think Minerva finds a middle ground. But I would say things like Lear, licensee estoppel, uh, you know, post-expiration royalties. A lot of the cases that were, you know, really uh, au courant in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and the 70s are a little bit outdated in the sense that they have a negative view of licensing. So getting licensing know-how into the hands of smaller companies, I think, would really be helpful. And, you know, it's teaching. It's not just acquiring the path. It's how you use it. And uh, uh, that's crucial. Yeah, so that's a good question. Yeah, and, and that, and I'll just add that that is something that we're aggressively working on, and it's something where you know I did have a, a nice period of time before I was confirmed, and um, and I used that time wisely and spent a lot of time looking into different things, including meeting with tech transfer offices at numerous universities and trying to figure out how universities and companies are doing things well, so that we can then translate that and make sure that everybody has access to things like that. And, and on pro bono, thinking more broadly about not only how do we help people get their patents, but how do we bring that to impact? That's why we've defined our vision is not just the protection, it's the you know, more innovation, and then it has to get to impact or there's no, and, and positive impact, not necessarily the, you know, the way patents are being used to, for privateering or things like that, but, but really for impact for jobs and you know, making sure that these, these products that are, are the result of research and development actually get into the marketplace. Paul. A nice, useful period, but the most kind and generous description I've heard for our, our current confirmation process. So I, I, <laughs> I think we've heard some very good ideas. I, I endorse them. The only thing I would just add in terms of um, further endorsement uh, of, of Rob's point, I actually think the USPTO is a model for separation of its examination function and outreach function, or its administrative law function more generally. Uh, that frankly many other agencies could look to. Uh, I think the fact that we are sitting here today, this morning, in a regional office here in San Jose is, is an excellent example of the innovation in that spirit um, that we've seen from the PTO over the last decade. Uh, and I fully endorse and embrace the idea that um, 
we could take the four regional offices and then put that on steroids and you think about extensions or, or other regional outreach settings. Not only gives us a better shot at drawing more people from more communities into the patent system, but also further um, develops and protects the legitimacy of the patent office um, in different communities all over the United States. I think it's critical, uh, critical to the success of the system. The only other thing I would just offer uh, by way of suggestion is that um, we, we, for as much success as we've had in, in, in diversifying um, participants in the system and the bar itself, we still have a very long way to go. You know, if you look at the most recent ABA study of this, we have something like roughly 20, 22 percent of the patent bar, for example, are, are women. That's still a very poor percentage, I think, by any general measure. Um, and, I, and I think that, um, the, that in terms of outreach, I think one of the things that the, the patent office can continue to do is to is to frame and describe participants in the system in very inclusive terms in the way that they have in the past. One, 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 one element of this, apart from more traditional um, communities that we talk about, that I think is sometimes overlooked is that we, we still very much fantasize uh, and, and, and hold up this ideal, this idea of a solo inventor operating in the 1870s or whatever he was. <laughs> it is cotton today. Forgotten that exact date, and I do think that even speaking uh, more more widely about the collaboration that underlies so much invention in this country, creating more appealing and more um, inclusive uh, conversation for communities that don't think of themselves as single people from a certain era operating based when it comes to invention. That's great. Uh, two thoughts. One of them is building off of Rob's idea. Um, I agree with you that the that the uh, ag role in basically getting into the communities is a really good model to be following. Um, the PTO has already done a great job of partnering with a number of private and governmental agencies in order to, to achieve this outreach mission. I would encourage the PTO going forward to continue to prioritize relationships where those agencies are already really well dug in because it's just a lot easier to build them that way. Small business association, small business development center come to mind, but I'm sure that there are others that would fall on that list. It seems like there's potentially a lot of synergy there, you know, for, for use of your resources. And the second bucket that I would suggest is partnering with educational institutions. I know that this is already going on. I would say even more so, and I say this both as a attorney and someone who has a significant science, science background or scientist before I came to this. I'm not sure that I ever really thought of myself as a potential inventor or engaging in the program except for a couple of sort of happenstance events. I took a class in college, one credit passed out fast that exposed me to the system, and my PI in grad school was involved in patenting. And so, you know, that exposure has led me in this direction. I think that it's important, I think that we can use universities, and certainly I think Chancellor is doing a great job on this, we're working on this too, you know, to access startups and academic inventors, especially in the life sciences world, is a lot of where you're going to find those individuals. You get a request all the time for additional education, for additional engagement in this space. PTO, we want you guys to be involved in that. I think that it also will have the side effect of recruiting more people into our profession because if they learn more about what we're doing, they're going to see how cool it is. They're going to want to engage more. So that's great. I'll just make a couple comments and then uh, turn to Mark. Um, we, we completely agree with you. And so I have had discussions with the Department of Education on K through 12 programming. I met with the California governor's office this week on that. I'm meeting with the Colorado governor's office on that. I'm also working with other countries on trying to work those kinds of things into our school system. You know, I think any engineering school would be great if they had a session that everybody had to take on innovation and what that looks like. And, you know, I used to, when I went through my engineering school, I had to do something, a graphics test in order to pass. So in addition to all the normal requirements, I had to do something that let the school know that I understood how things looked in 3D. It was the, the oddest thing, but I thought, wow, we could just do something around that, around innovation, and letting people know in the beginning, not when they're graduating, but from the beginning, how they should be thinking about that. I would love that. Also working it into our business schools and thinking about a way that the U.S. PTO can be um, a catalyst for that can help provide content that to make it easy because that's the one thing I've heard because I'm also engaged with companies and you with CEOs of major companies and said I'd love to have a, an inclusive innovation video that you show just like you show unconscious bias training 
that everybody sees it. They know not only what innovation is, how to cultivate innovation within the organization, but how to think about it inclusively. Um, and, and across the board, everybody is in favor of this, and they just they, want, they need the collateral. So that's something that we need to work on. Great. Mark? Uh, yeah, I want to focus not on how to get more people into the system, but what happens to them once they are there. Um, uh, Abe Aneha at uh, uh, Berkeley has a really interesting study uh, on sort of responses to uh, uh, office actions. Um, and so, as we all know in the patent system, right, uh, you'll get a rejection or a final rejection, and the final rejection is uh, nothing like a final rejection, right? It's an opening bid to say, call the examiner and talk it out, or file a continuation application, or something of that nature. But it turns out that uh, women disproportionately, if they get a final rejection, they think, oh, the patent office said no, I go home. Uh, men uh, uh, view this as an opportunity to sort of fight back their open negotiation. That seems like a problem. Right, and one way you can solve the problem, I think, is is to try to intervene. And that PTO, I think, has already sort of had some pilot uh, projects where you sort of like just try to talk to people about what this means. But you can institutionalize that. So if you get if you get a filing from a court, uh, uh, a lot of courts will generally now include a kind of plain English: here are your rights, here are the things you need to do by a certain time, here's what you can do, etc. Uh, something that just communicated that information to the people who aren't game playing in the system, right, who aren't experienced repeat practitioners would be good. Might also more generally cause us to rethink whether this is the system we want, right, <laughs> uh, right, whether final rejection and the kind of, you know, the back and forth is the right way to go. Because I do think it's not just sort of that it disproportionately affects women, right, it's unfair to anybody who doesn't really know how the game is played, uh, and that's a problem. So, so we're on it. I, I appreciate that. I saw that study, and that's the first thing that came to mind is people, because I do think there's there's biases in our system and biases in the way different people look at different things, right? That, and you, you're right, you're absolutely right. I, mean, I would have guessed that was the outcome just from all the science I've read on those biases. And so um, we're on that, we're looking into the best way to do that because I think that is critical that not only to get people into the system, but to make sure that they, they do understand their rights. And you're right, it's, it, it breaks down on gender, sometimes it breaks down in other ways as well. Um, and so that is definitely something that's high on our priority with a bunch of other things that are high on our priority um, to, to attack uh, for all. So th thank you for raising that and for raising the survey because um, I, I think that that was great to have that survey because that that was brought to my attention and that's what led me to believe we need to, we need to fix this. Um, so we were gonna go to pro bono next, but I'm almost wondering given the time if we should do the rapid fire and then hit pro bono. Does that, yeah, that's does that make sense? One comment I will make yeah. is I do want to highlight the PTO's work here in uh, a report that's coming forthcoming with some authors in the Office of Treaty Economists. And there is this recognition, and I've heard about it, Mark, and others, that commodities, there's a big <coughs> grant gap. Those who actually comply get their patents at a lower rate than those that are larger. And the first day uh, patent program was created in 2014 to actually give and allow for experienced examiners to work as generalists and get specialized training and then give pro se applicants extra support. Uh, and it took a lot of research, I think, uh, focus, but they randomized to actually got for treatment and actually able to show that the pro se unit had a huge impact on the um, outcome and increased the grant rate by five or six percentage points, but the grant rate for women inventors went up by 11 percentage points. And it basically closed the gender patent gap in certain areas. So PTO is doing work in this area that's measuring the impact, I think it shows the value of doing this sort of uh, focus um, Piloting. And I'm really excited to hear about Dr. Vidal actually talking about interim and final, right? The approach of measuring what is actually happening before we actually go in. I think that's great, Colleen, and thanks for mentioning that. And, and it just reinforces that a lot of the things we're thinking about doing are going to right equities, but they're also going to help the small inventors, they're also going to help the small to medium sized enterprises, and it's all aligned. So that, that, that gives me a lot of joy knowing that once, once we roll these out, it's going to help everybody. Um, so I'm going to do, we were going to talk about pro bono, which hopefully we'll get have time to talk about. If not, you're going to hear a lot of discussion about pro bono on lots of different channels. Uh, but what I want to make sure we don't miss is a rapid fire of the panel on what is the most impactful thing you think the USPTO can do to advance the USPTO's mission, which is more innovation, innovation to impact and protecting it. So it's pretty much everything. So what is, what is your big idea? Uh, let's start with Mark. Uh, great. Well, I'm going to shift gears from Pat to trademark. Um, so uh, I think uh, the thing that you can do uh, to, to help improve the system is to tackle the problem of uh, fake uh, trademark registrations, fake trademark specifications by people who don't actually use the mark. 
Barton Beebe and Jeannie Fromer have a great study on this, all right, and the really significant percentage of cases, especially uh, applications filed from China, but by no means limited to them, that just turn out to, you know, do not, to not involve any actual use in commerce, to involve fake specimens uh, provided for use. So the good news is, right, Congress has already done something with the Trademark Modernization Act in 2020. Uh, the PTO has regulations implementing it as of December, which are great. Um, and they allow this for an expungement proceeding, right, to try to get rid of marks that were never actually used. Um, but I think that's not enough. So one of the problems, one of the reasons that people do this is uh, goes to the sort of uh, uh, the informal dispute resolution procedures mentioned earlier. In a lot of uh, uh, intermediary companies, right, in Amazon, in uh, Cafe Press or Redbubble, right, that produce things made by someone else, um, there is no Digital Millennium Copyright Act for trademarks. Uh, with a notice and takedown regime. And so what the companies have done is they've decided, hey, if you've got a registered trademark and you come to us, we'll just take down everybody else's product uh, that has that registered trademark. And so one of the ways you can basically sort of get ahead of uh, other companies or get some money by squeezing people from it is to sort of get a registered trademark and say, oh, now, see, I own Black Lives Matter uh, uh, and you can't put it on T-shirts. Um, and this is a problem, right? And we can sometimes solve the problem if we can persuade people to come in and file an expungement proceeding. But often they don't know that there is such a thing, they don't have the money to do it, et cetera. So what I would encourage is uh, to sort of couple that with action at the PTO, at the director level, right? Uh, to proactively do some randomized checking, uh, do some spot checks of things, right? Maybe focus those spot checks on things like T-shirts, right, where this problem is particularly acute. Um, uh, and then if you start to find problems, I think one of the things you could do is you could have special rules for repeat infringers. If it turns out that, you know, you filed two or three fake specimens, maybe we should look at all of your uh, trademark applications, right? Maybe we should have a higher bar uh, for you before you come in and say, uh, uh, yes, I, now I've got a new trademark. And so this is, I mean, this is not going to sort of save the world, right? But I think it is a very specific practical thing that we can do, right, that doesn't just declutter the register, but it improves the lives of a bunch of people who are out there selling products uh, and are kind of getting targeted for doing it. So, so I appreciate that, and to some extent, we are doing that. So the, the PTO is issuing sanctions, so we're, we're self-monitoring. I met again with the, with the trademarks this week on that. We're self-monitoring to try and figure out where this is happening, and we've caught a number of people, and there's going to be more sanctions coming out soon. I think the sanctions are incredibly important to stop the behavior, to isolate it, to not let those practitioners ever practice again before the PTO, and to um, and then just the notice of the sanctions hopefully works as a deterrent for other people doing it. I love your ideas on your, some of what the Amazons and the cafe presses are doing. There's probably an opportunity for more of a dialogue on what are they seeing and are there things that we should check, like the t-shirt part. I don't know that we're specifically looking at the t-shirt category of, on this issue, but that's a really good thing to think about. It's like what kind of takedowns are they getting so that we can you know, have a whole um, closed loop system on this. So I love that idea. Laura. Okay, so um, I feel like we're all, not just the USPTO, but we're all uh, sitting in a very special period right now where we just all collectively went through several years of having to find different ways to engage with ourselves and our communities. And so um, to kind of just build on what Robert, um, what Robert said about outreach and outreach to people, I, I would challenge the PTO to think about other ways to outreach other than putting satellite offices. Sure, you put satellite offices and more satellite offices, but perhaps in-person outreach isn't necessarily the only way that you could engage with the, um, the, the people out there that might not otherwise be engaging with the USPTO. And maybe it's even something so out there as creating PTO ambassadors on creative platforms like Minecraft and Roblox or something. I don't know. But, you know, engaging with folks that might not be in person engaging. And, um, and there's just a lot that we've learned through the last few years. So I, I appreciate that, and, and we're, we're thinking along the same lines, and you know, again, meeting people where they are, and those two platforms, I just have to have <coughs> really quick stories. So um, I went to speak to second graders on <coughs> World IP Day, and you know, I was introduced as the director and undersecretary and all that. We went through a whole session. I got a book to them, Abby Invents. I went around and looked at their inventions, and somebody, one of the kids had a Roblox invention, 
And so I looked at it and I said, oh, my son is a Roblox developer. And then all of a sudden the energy <laughs> level went from a two to a 50, like, oh my God. <laughs> so you're right. I mean, that's where people are. And that's, that's where they need to be met. And, you know, I, I thought about that and thought in the future, I should just have to be introduced as the mother of a Roblox developer and the director. <laughs> but it just, it just, that level of energy just shows that great that I was there in that school. I mean, it was only one school and we can't scale that. But if you get to the platforms, that's, that, that's where it makes uh, would make a big difference. Okay, we've got five minutes left, it looks like. So now we're going to do super rapid fire, and I'm not going to comment on any of the comments. So, Rob. Okay, I'll be quick. I can turn this thing on. <clears throat> uh, main points. Keep IPRs. They're working. The attacks on them show they're working. Um, remember that, that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beneficial part of the system. Second, I, I should say whatever the state of 101 case law, an easy solution for making it less impactful is to just put it last. Um, do 102, 103, 112 first, certainly in prosecution. And then, you know, because of the value of a quick look doctrine, we need to tighten up somehow the 12B6 process in litigation. And, you know, it's, it's always a sort of a fraud exercise. But what you want to do is just, just identify really easy, low-hanging fruit, you know, like a quick look doctrine and antitrust law. Just say, this is obviously, you know, this patent is invalid seven ways to Sunday and bounce it. Short of that, no, pass it on to the other tech. So um, anyway, put one on one last. Paul. Oh. Remember and appreciate that the PTAP is one of not just the great patent innovations, over the last 10 years, I would argue it's one of the top five administrative law in the country. We should nurture it. We should invest in it. Uh, we should protect it. I mentioned after director review on institution decisions, the only other thing I would argue that could um, be helpful um, that is perhaps achievable, given all the constraints you operate under in your role, consider the, re the, uh, the rehearing process. Right now, you essentially go back to the same folks who made the decision on rehearing. Rehearing is not really an effective procedure. Consider a reassignment of those decisions to another group of folks. Thank you. Elsa. Uh, continue and in, in, in enhance patent quality initiatives. I think that it's the whole thing that you can do to increase confidence, confidence levels. The validity of issued patents is what occurs licensing and here notice letters. Two problems on this. First one, one way to increase the quality of the initial search and the examination itself, application and not patent literature. I know it's a challenging problem to deal with. Frankly, it's hard to search for. I've had multiple times as a practitioner where we kind of gave up on the prior art search, went to experts who had been working in the space at the time of the invention to help us identify the non-patent literature. It's hard to search. So I understand that this is a big ask. But I do think that you know, continuing to think about how to make it easier to search, how to make it easier to access, and I want to give credit to Colleen as you're transitioning towards AI searching, making sure to watch the biases on your algorithm that you're training on data. For, for patent literature versus non-patent literature. The second prong, and this is sort of a shout out for my practitioner friends, making sure that the prosecution record is as clear as possible. It's relevant in litigation, it's relevant in diligence issues, relevant pre-litigation issues, and especially in the latter two, where you typically have a short budget or no budget at all, in a really short period of time that you can review. I was always thrilled as a practitioner when the examiner took a really detailed look at an amendment that they had made, or outline the interview that they had in real clarity, and especially when they commented on the declarations on the record of Disha. Really made my day. I think finding ways to incentivize the, that kind of detail for examiners would be really fantastic. It would really help practitioners. It would just really help the record be as clear as complete as possible. Any last words, Colleen? No, I just say I applaud you for the listening session. I think you know, continue to listen and bring people together. Um, some of the ideas talked about here as they progress, you know, bringing them, you know, folks here and others together to talk about them and hash them out in public, I think, is really very healthy. Perfect. Well, I appreciate that, and I, I promise not to comment on the last two things, but you are going to see a lot more coming out soon. So um, please engage with us, give us your ideas, comment when we have our uh, request for comments, et cetera. So thanks to everyone in the room and obviously those who joined remotely as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.